Good evening, y'all. Welcome back to another Sunday night of chicanery and nerdiness. Uh, a little bit later than usual, uh, and a little bit wilder than usual. Um, we'll get right into the business of prepping the next bits of hardware for the Micro Kabuki drop uh, shortly. Um, but good to see you. Hey, Thomas, good to see you. Um, we uh, It's been a wild day, y'all. I will totally confess. Uh, we had a surprise need to drive about three hours out of town. Um, for all, all perfectly fine reasons, uh, but we spent about six and a half hours in the car today, got home about 6.30, um, walked the dog real quick, picked up a new light board on the walk, uh, got home, slammed some quiche, and now we're here. <laughs> so I feel like I'm still going about 70 miles an hour, uh, but uh, but it's good to be here. So this will be a nice, a nice like ramp down into some project solving this evening, I think actually is exactly what I need. Hey, Chris, good to see you. Um, yeah, so we'll have a we'll have a fun old a fun old time tonight. Um, I don't really think any further news except tonight's beverage of choice is a Two Brothers Northwind Stout, which is not my usual like stouts. I do not drink a lot of, but this is actually really nice and mild. Um, you know, I think of stouts as a winter beer, and it's like sixty six in Chicago today. It's not bad at all. Um, but this is very light and very pleasant and mild. So you know, a, a tasty drink even as the the spring is thankfully finally warming up. If you're I, I'm curious, as always, Chris, you are often usually drinking something curious, although as always, no pressure for not, but curious if people are drinking fun things tonight. And if not, I hope you're hydrating. Broke both, good to see you. Um, <laughs> need a light board? Not a huge light board. Um, it's a, it's a, uh, a DJ style light board, but it has a lot more chase features than any of the other physical boards I currently have. Um, and it was free. Uh, from our, like, neighborhood, like, free exchange group, uh, from someone who Mary actually knew, who works, uh, who, like, understudied a show she stage managed a few years ago. So I was like, oh, I'll take that light board. She was like, you're getting a light board from this person? I know that person. Amazing. So that was delightful. Um... So yeah, so we'll have a fun time with that. It's literally still sitting in a box in the porch. I didn't feel like trying to decipher it on stream. Um, I think it'll be a useful tool for building easy, like, chases for the micro stage and stuff. Um, speaking of which, uh, some progress here. So these are more copies of the... Wow, it's, that tilt is going to drive me crazy, if not anybody else. Let's see if we can... I, I really need to find a better, a better solution for this and a more permanent one. Um, oh yeah, the shadow of the camera is on the thing. Yeah, this will be fine. Um, so we got more of the brackets that we designed last time, right? Our little three-way brackets here with more of our standard hooks and our 3 16 brass rod that's going to form the core of our micro kabuki drop. Um, this is the same servo mechanism we used last time to play with. I think we'll probably switch this around and move it over to uh, stage right, if you will, if y'all's camera is the... Um, you know, this is the audience, which I think is reasonable. Oh, hey, Dave, good to see you. Water, yes, hydrate on this lovely... As, as It's funny, I feel like in the winter I don't hydrate enough because it's super dry and I dry out. In the summer, it's super hot, I don't hydrate enough. Maybe I just don't hydrate enough. Um, but in any case, I think I'm going to move uh, the driver unit over to stage left because I think we peeked at this last time. You might be able to see this little fleck of green back here. That's the demi light control board that's currently driving the truss warmers. Um, the NeoPixel truss warmers that are in this <laughs> in this downstage truss. Um, and I can use the servo outputs on it to also drive the Kabuki job if I feel like it. And since I already have it there and I have a DMX line running over to the desk, that just seems like the easiest thing. Um, so yeah, so it's fun to have like have a, a little start of something hanging in the air here. I also have on the bench, and I have not tested these yet. Maybe this is where we should start. Um, I have, well, I have a beer. And I have a scrap of not a kabuki drop. <laughs> um, but I also have some of the parts and pieces uh, that Thomas designed for us uh, that are revisions of the Thomas coupler, right? That's coupling the servo uh, connection point to the, um, the brass rod itself. And then also in a similar vein, some things that I whipped up. Um, that are just like a coupler between two separate sets of tube. Because you might be able to tell, and I think we discovered this last time, like the longest sections of this brass rod that I have, which are all <laughs> all offcuts from 3D printed flowers that I made for our wedding. Um, like this is the longest segment I have, and it's maybe 150 millimeters long. 150 centimeters would be really nice, but I don't have that. So I'm going to couple some of these pieces together for now, just to have a thing to to work with. I'm kind of seeing, oh, I see. I was like, this, the rod was not lining up evenly with all of these hooks, but this one, this hook was just not snapped in all the way. Um, so now that's making a little more sense. Um, so I think maybe actually one of the first things we should do is experiment with um, 
the the this new coupling unit to see if this is viable. Um, let's see here. You can look at the table and not my tum while I grab the big old bin of things, including the brass cutoffs in my increasingly inaccurately named craft stuff bin, which has things like uh, styrene in various textures and balsa wood. Uh, I guess that might be basswood. Uh, faux brick texture in like one sixty-fourth scale and a piece of acrylic. Like, it, this is kind of just my dumping bin for interesting materials. So the brass rod cutoffs have ended up in there. Um, honestly, like the thing I use most out of this bin is the floral wire. I love floral wire for just like randomly lashing things together. It's also a great way to like hang things as you're spray painting them. Um, that is not an original idea, by the way, that I, I, I stole that idea from props masters through the ages who use all kinds of interesting wire to suspend things in their spray booths. But, uh, I, I stole it and I like it. So thanks. Ooh, I've popped my, popped my headphone thing out so I can't hear the sweet jams that keep us going. So let's see here if the idea behind these was that one end fits into one brass tube. It's a pretty snug fit, but I think that's good. There's not a stop in the middle, I realize, so I should, I'll probably have to, I should probably put one of those in. Um, but for right now, we'll just kind of wedge a couple in there. I mean, honestly, even without any additional coupling, like the idea was, right, to put a little pinhole through here and put maybe, uh, these are like a two millimeter diameter hole, so maybe it's a little piece of 1.85 millimeter filament or a little piece of wire, just something to lash it in place. Even without that, that's a really rigid coupling. What I don't want to happen, right, is if I'm driving it from this side, I don't want this to spin and this to be stuck by friction and just spin in the coupler here. Um, but that's actually really quite snug and solid, which I quite like. Um, maybe let's, let's do a little quick experiment about what it would mean to try and secure that a little bit more. Um, this is, by the way, not the, not the main project of tonight. The main project of tonight, I think, although I think this will be informative of that work, is um, working on the hooks that actually allow us to attach the curtain to this spinning rod to allow a curtain to fall off of it. Um, and I kind of have two, or maybe it's one and a half, or maybe it's two and a half ideas. It's kind of one idea with some variants. Um, and I'm, I, I haven't thought them all the way through <laughs> as usual. So I'm interested to see what, what feedback or other ideas people have about that as we go along. But first, let me, let me see if this works. Because if it doesn't, we'll make some quick changes. We'll get it going on the 3D printer before we dive into designing the hooks. I am just looking around for what's going to be the simplest and quickest way for me to punch holes through these. I mean, the right answer is probably my cordless drill, but my drill bits are rather far away. Um, but maybe that's the way to go here. Here, again, you can enjoy a scenic view of this here table. I'm gonna mute myself. And I'm gonna unmute myself because we're, you know, uh, we're big and fancy here. Um, but yeah, I think I think drilling. Just we'll do a quick drill hole. I'll probably mute the mic while I'm drilling it because you don't need to listen. You all know what a drill sounds like, and I won't be able to say anything during it anyway. Let's see if I have a nice small drill bit in my. I don't have a proper drill index currently. Um, I don't I don't drill things that often, to be perfectly honest. It doesn't look like I have anything quite small enough. It's a shame. I have a, I have a, you know, a 64 piece <laughs> drill index at work that I get spoiled by, um, and another like 30 piece metric set. But I just, I don't, you know, the work I do, it's mostly additive. I'm not drilling huge bits of things. Well, maybe, maybe we shan't worry about that for now. Let's see if another coupler goes on just as well. Yeah, I think this is going to be fine, at least for tonight. And I can, you know, find my set of drill bits. But that's going to be basically the, the pipe that makes up the active part of our Kabuki drop. Oh, wow, that works pretty well. Thanks. Thomas, credits you. I just stole the dimensions from your couplers, which we, we found last time were quite snug and quite a good fit, so I stole them. Thank you again. 
<laughs> um, Thomas also added, a, 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 so I also ripped off the idea of the like pin hole registration pin uh, from Thomas who added this to the Thomas coupler and sent it to me last week, which is, I'm excited to try out when I can, you know, punch holes in things. All right, so that's exciting. So this is this is our, if we look at our, you know, our stage, this is going to be our batten, our rotating batten that forms the Kabuki drop itself, which I think is going to be great. In fact, maybe we'll just tack one of these onto the existing mechanism and then thread it back into place. Let's see, how is we going to do this? I think I'll thread this through that hook. Now where this support is currently, this center support is actually right on where the coupler wants to be, which is unfortunate. So I think you're gonna have to move that. So put that aside and we'll move this center support. Oops, there we go. And we shall just pop our two pieces together and then thread them back into, I guess I can't thread it because it's got this coupler on it now. I have to kind of hook it like it was some kind of hook, which it is. And I'll put that back into the Thomas coupler and now, uh-huh, now we're starting to look like a drop. There we go. Something is still, something's not quite plumb here. I'm, I don't know if you can see this, but this is kind of floating up and out of this hook a little bit. Now when we put the weight of a curtain on it, I'm sure that will self-correct. Oh, you know what it is? It's my, my truss. Uh, I have a loose truss connection here that's bowing slightly under the weight of the, the materials on it. They're just held together with number six screws and wing nuts. I, I know this, this probably looks like Nothing, because <laughs> the camera, I still need to sort out. But yeah, so that, that truss is, is bowing upwards still. But I will correct that at some point. And, or maybe I'll here I'll just loosen the connection. It'll settle back into level, into plumb, I guess, or level. I had, a, um, I had a carpenter really take me to task once about the difference between plumb and uh, level, which I had really taken as granted, taken for granted up until that point, right? Level being a thing which is uh, parallel to the ground, typically, or parallel to the local gravitational force. Um, plumb is something that is perpendicular, right? So you use a plumb bob, right? so you have a you have vertical line that keeps your vertical surfaces vertical. Vertical. You use a, uh, if something is level, it is equally heighted horizontally, I guess. Um, now you can use a bubble level tool to find either of those conditions. Right? In theory, if you have a bubble level, right, which is meant for making things level, but you could also use it to make things plumb. But the two terms are not synonymous, I was told. And I believe it. And so I think that's a, a useful distinction to make. Um, I just was like, oh, this is it's level this way, or maybe it's level this way. No, plumb is the idea. All right, well, the couplers work. So let's look at hooks. And let me start by just sketching out... Um, the two kind of ideas that I have for... Now, they're not radically different in their construction, um, but they are different kind of in how they will behave um, with the curtain itself. So one idea, which I will call the blue idea because I'm drawing it in blue, is that uh, looked at uh, in a section of the pipe, right? So looking at down the batten, the shape and position of the hook in its ready position, if, uh, if, <laughs> if down is this way, just to be clear, and here's our pipe that we're looking at side on. Um, one option would be to have uh, what I think, what I have been imagining this whole time, um, because it's the model of Kabuki Drops that I have seen full size in person, is a hook that's something, you know, sticking out like this. And for our 3D printed purposes, there's probably something that maybe it surrounds the whole pipe. And I'm, I've been imagining something with a, uh, a set screw uh, that goes through and sort of locks under the pipe a little bit so this doesn't spin on its own. Um, and uh, maybe a couple other features that we'll get to. But this is sort of the, the one, one way of doing it. And then the curtain, if I choose another color, because I have lots of colors, the curtain hangs just from these pegs, hangs down off the bat, and it hangs straight down like that. This is kind of the model I have seen before. This was the looking glass drop model. Um, you know, relatively easy to construct. And when you, you know, in a in a full-size model, when you release the uh, batten and give it the ability to spin, this is now at a nice angle. It has a lot of torque to 
cause the pipe to rotate downward and drop the curtain off the ends of those pegs, right? The other option um, that I have, I have not seen full size, and this one probably has some flaws in it, um, is to, if this, again, if this is the pipe, to have the hooks hang down like so. And then there's a, you know, all of the other parameters of the thing. There's a maybe probably a collar that surrounds the pipe, maybe with a set screw and some other features. Um, but in this model, the curtain hangs directly down from here. And similarly, when this rotates, the, the hooks will get out of the way and the curtain will fall. Um, the, the reason that I've been considering this option is, and again, this, this is, these are both half-baked ideas. So if you have better ones or you see flaws, let me know. Um, but if the advantage of this one is this curtain could be directly below the axis of the pipe itself. And so this, this mechanism has a fair amount of torque always on the pipe, causing it to want to rotate. This one, in theory, is in equilibrium. Um, and so it is not reliant on, for, in our case, the stepper maintaining power to stay upright. Like in this, in this situation, there may be enough torque on the pipe that if the stepper, which is holding it here, loses power, it might just go and drop the curtain, whereas this one is statically stable. Mm, but Chris makes a good point. Will that hook be strong enough for printing maybe a paperclip wire inserted into the print? That's fair. Yeah, strength-wise, we might have some concerns. Um, especially with sort of the end of this print. Although I drew it very tapered. I wonder maybe in profile it wants to look a little something. I guess everything... So the only parts of this... Let's let's zoom in a little bit here um, on this, this same design. The only parts of this hook that the curtain itself is going to interact with is everything... If this is rotating this way for action, the curtain's only going to interact with this little segment, right? So that's really the only shape-critical part. Um, and maybe, you know, a little bit extra... So if we don't hit our straight up and down angle like we think we will, it will still sort of self-center. Um, but this, there's no reason that this part has to be another like curve. We could come, you know, straight up with a bunch of plastic, a bunch of mass straight up from that point. Um, ah, Chris was thinking about the blue one. Yeah, so similarly, like we're going to want to, you know, the, the, the part of the reason I think that I have this shape in my head is that in the full-size model I saw, worked with, used, struggled with, this was a two-inch Schedule 40 pipe, and these were little pieces of, like, three-eighths, uh, you know, round steel stock that were just tack-welded onto the pipe. And so in my mind, I'm like, oh, they're little, little fingers, because in, you know, a, a steel thing welded to a steel pipe is going to be plenty strong, but you're right, Chris, in plastic, that might not be terribly secure. So something, something where this shape, this sort of semicircular shape, so we have our sort of self, self leveling property is maintained, I think is good. But to your point, we'll want to make this arm, the rest of this armature, as stout as possible. This is also probably not to scale in the pipe. This is probably, you know, this whole thing is the pipe here. Um, I guess it's also it's fair to say I don't have a spec weight for the curtain, um, so I don't know how strong it has to be yet. Uh, Maybe, and honestly, I might work backwards, like as strong as the mechanism can be. The other thing I'm thinking is, there's no reason that this has to be particularly thin. Like this could be fattened up a little bit if this was hanging from, you know, I think in my in my messing around last time, I just punched some holes in a piece of, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Marine vinyl. Um, but if we were to do this kind of like a theatrical curtain, we could thread thread or tile or wire through here and give ourselves a little bit of distance between the curtain and the arm so that the you know the curtain hangs down here and then we have this sort of additional hanging loop that goes up and over our arm structure so this arm could also be beefed up some i think that's got some possibility well let's take it over to fusion and start laying this design in and see what we what we can identify when we get there and maybe get a draft printing and go on to draft two so, let's see here. Ah, so, so this is my, my messing around with the, the so-called Thomas coupler and making our, our additional pipe coupler there. Let me save that and I will close it out and start a new design. Oh, editable fusion documents reached. So this is, this is the thing that as any of you who have used fusion recently know, right? They take the free version now only allows you to have um, 10 editable documents at once. Um, 
Now, it, all, to, to change them back and forth, right, all you have to do is go into your files and say, okay, this is one is now read-only for right now, this one is now editable. I think this would be a much bigger deal if you were a, you know, a full-fledged design company who was working on these documents simultaneously or interactively, right? And if you're a full-size design company, you're, you're meant to be paying for the product, right? That's the whole, the whole model of Fusion is you pay when you're a company and you use it for free when you're a nerd hobbyist making no money on their projects at home. Um, but a slightly, slightly annoying, I think still a very fair trade-off for the value that I get for out of Fusion for free. Um, because making them editable or not seems like a pain. It kind of is. I mean, the fact that you have, like, I, I think of like how many of these do I really have open for working on at once at any given time? Um, and it's at most like two or three. So yes, yeah, so you turn some of the editables off and you make them read only. And then when you want to work on them again, you make them editable, but it, it takes no time. Um, so it's, it's, I don't think it's that bad. It's a little bit annoying. Um, and it would be a genuine limitation for like a, a working company. Let's think a little bit more. So this, this inner part here is going to represent the clearance to our pipe. This one is going to represent a, a chonky um, hanger around the pipe. Um, Let's see. One thing I know before, so I think the hook is going to hang down here. One thing I have been thinking about all day is I'm going to want to have a um, a flattened off section somewhere to provide um, an easy way to make sure that all of the successive hooks all line up. Um, so if I have a flattened section, then when I go to put these on a pipe, now if I put one on and attach its set screw, I could slide the other one on, lay both of their flat sections down on a table and line them up that way and then attach the second set screw and then do a third and so on. So that was that's a, a, literal, a literal shower thought that came to me earlier today. Um, we'll just give that a dimension so it's defined. You know, a little less material there, but I think that will be okay. Um, and now let's start to find, oh, let's save. <laughs> let's save our design first. Um, and we will say, we'll call this, I think I have a, Kabuki folder? Do I? Maybe not. Moving light PCB. This will be called the Kabuki hook. Um, so let's see here. So I am just going to start sketching some things out. So let's make, let's do this as an arc. We'll do a center point arc from here to here. And this is going to be like the inside surface of our, our hook portion. Um, let's get this aligned. Can I, let's see, working with arcs can be uh, just a little bit screwy. So I think actually I might do this as a circle and then I'll cut the arc out of it that I want. So we'll just draw a circle centered on our pipe here. Um, we're going to say that our hook is maybe three millimeters thick again. Um, and that it ends, I mean, I don't need a whole lot of, you know, additional hook room here. Let's say it's there and that the dimension of that from vertical is like 15 degrees, maybe. So we'll add a dimension there to make it uh, 20. That feels about right. Um, we'll probably chamfer that off, round it off a little bit here. And so in that case, let's make, let's give ourselves 20 degrees in each direction to play with. We'll mirror this across center. Um, you make the endpoints of the arc horizontal. I, cer I certainly could. Um, I'm just a little more comfortable working with it as a circle because I might use this circle. Like I might make a tangent circle to this circle to bring our, our arc body back in um, like so, actually. So I'm going to make a circle. I do not want it to be construction. I'm going to make it tangent to this circle. I'm going to make it tangent to this circle. Um, and there we go. So that defines some of its size. Now I wonder, there we go. And I want, now what is undefined here? Oh, my, the, the distance to my hook is undefined. That's what's floating here. So I shall, let's make that 20 millimeters is really generous, but I guess this inner mechanism is five millimeters. So I have 15 millimeters distance between my hook and my sort of central part here. That seems fine. Um, and then I want to put a point at the intersection of these two circles, which I think it will snap to. Yeah. And then I want that point to be coincident with this line. Oops. Ah, uh, I guess I can make this coincident with this circle as well. There we go. 
So now, so this is starting to look like a bit of a mess. I uh, agree. Um, ooh, but this is not what I wanted to do at all. I want this to be tangent in a different way. So I really want this to be tangent here. Tangent. Uh-huh. Um, and then I want another circle, also not construction, uh, also tangent to the large circle and this outer circle. There we go. Uh, so that I'm going to create sort of a, a, a smoothly curving hook for <laughs> aesthetics reasons um, that I think will, will look nice and have a lot of um, solidity to it. There's that. will be coinciding with that. Now I could trim this all up, but let's just let's extrude this a little bit first to see if I've if I've gotten it quite right. So I want that shape. Oh, except I've got this flat cutoff part here, which means that this tangent circle is not going to tangent to anything because I've I've cut off that little bit. So really, what I want is if I shrink this down and I put a new point at the flat point here, then I will, and I, this, I think I'm just babbling at this point, but I, I swear it's to, to an end. <laughs> Make those coincident, yeah, okay. So now I will extrude that and that and this and that and this and this and that. And that will be our hook shape, maybe? Except this could be filled in and I wouldn't lose anything. So I think it should be. <laughs> Because I think the more support we have, the better. And we'll chamfer some of these edges off so we don't have these sharp these sharp interruptions. Um, let's extrude this by 4 millimeters. He said making the number up. Ooh, ooh, that didn't go well. Uh, let's try that again. So I want this and this. So I didn't need this small circle in, in here at all, but that's all right. Uh, and we'll do... Now, what the hell is happening here? All right, let's... Four millimeters, four millimeters. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so this this is looking correct. I am building up my body, and then when I hit OK, I get. <laughs> well, that's not what I want at all. Why is that happening? Uh, let's leave. Maybe we leave that segment. Something is not solving right. I think is what's happening. Um, why don't I leave that little bottom nubbin out for now? The one, the only one that is staying, and see if things go better. They do. That's bizarre. So now if I edit this extrude and I include that lower shape, I get just that lower shape. Well, I hate that. Um, maybe, let's see, if I turn this sketch back on and do an extrude join. And we're in business. Okay. Well, that was bizarre. So that's kind of, that's the provisional shape of our of our thing. Now there's a lot of additional mass on this side in terms of the plastic, but I think in the end design, like the curtain is going to be the majority of the weight that's on this pipe, at least I, I presume so. Um, so I think this is going to be okay. So now let us just do a couple of quick fillets in here and then we'll figure out a set screw because I think that's going to be necessary. Do a quick fillet there. We'll do a quick fillet one and two here. Just to give that a nice, oops, a nice rounded surface to slip off of. Um, and everything else I think will be fine. Today's brought to you by the, yes, by the number nine and the letter E. <laughs> All right, so as far as set screws go, um, let me see if I, so I have a little container of, well, here, uh, you get to look at, I don't know, you can have it some Tommy Cam. You've been very good, thank you. And you've been very patient and agreeable as I've been moving the time around, um, which, for which I thank you. Um, Cause you know, that's just a thing that happens. And it's a, it's a jewel, like, I, you know, I say this every week I feel like, but I thank you for joining us here. It's really very fun to have people involved in this project. Um, and good to see some familiar names and faces and always fun to see new names and faces. I guess not, not faces, but names and words and people. Um, I'm just looking up here. I know you can't see it. Uh, for my, I have a collection of grub screws, which are, you know, screws without a, machine screws without a head on them, um, that you can use specifically. I, I would, I would just, if I didn't 
think that they were called grub screws, which they are, I would just call them set screws. You know, little little hex head screws, little hex um, keyable screws that allow you to, you know, thread them entirely within the body of a thing. Now, I don't, I can't seem to find them, but I'm wondering if I have my M3 grub screws uh, set aside in my M3 hardware bin, and I do. So that will be good. Chris's, <laughs> Chris's face is here and a smiley, which is, which is about right. That's what, Chris, that's how I, I do think of you is as a small, as a small yellow smiling face on, uh, on an emoji. So let's see here. So I've got, uh, here we go. Some M3, some M3. So this is a, this is a grub screw or what I would call a grub screw, right? So it's a, it's a machine screw of a certain size. This is, happens to be a, an M3 one. This one has an Allen keyed, you know, a hex keyed slots. So you can screw it all the way in. And because it has no head at all, you can screw it entirely within a threaded piece, right? So I, I don't know that that threading entirely within a threaded piece is going to be a necessary part of this design, um, but it makes it, it very low pro profile and low weight. So I think we're gonna use these threaded inserts, which I know I've railed against before, but I think this is going to be a fine application of them. I'm gonna use those to, um, to embed a threaded part into our um, uh, into our hook, so that we can thread a set screw into it, so that it will not move uh, on our pipe. And to find the dimensions of the hole that those pieces need to go into, I'm actually going to go back and reference an earlier demi light design, because of course, up until version 0.94. 0.95, we were using uh, M3 set screws to, um, to, to attach the hanging hardware for our light until that stream where we came up with the like clip-in hooks. Um, so let's go back to like the moving light case version 090. So this is this design is from last September, or at least the, last September was the last time I made a change to this design. Um, We'll see if it will load successfully. There we go. And I just I know that this dimensioning is is correct at least for the the threaded inserts that I have. So let's just steal it. Um, this is a diameter diameter a diameter of three point seven five millimeters. So that will be sufficient for our purposes. <laughs> Thomas has a face as well. It's sticking its tongue out at me. That's also fair. <laughs> Thomas and I have never actually met face to face, but I feel like that I if, if I if I someday meet you in person, Thomas, and you make that face, I'll be like, yeah, that's that seems reasonable. <laughs> um, all right, so in our hook here, so now we have our our radius that we need. Let's get the height of the inserts that I'm atten uh, uh, intending to use. <laughs> this looks like a like a weird, creepy guy here. call him Mr. Kabuki. So I'm just going to take the height of my uh, my threaded inserts here with my caliper just so I can size the hole appropriately. Five millimeters. Ah, okay. That's right. This so I have some, some three millimeters, some two millimeter. Excuse me. Two and three and five and like seven millimeter and, and even bigger than that. But this must be a five millimeter one. And that's that's just by eyeballing, that's the size I'd like to use. So we'll, we'll adjust the hole to fit that. So let's see here. So let's see. So let's just for, for interest sake, like that could go in a couple of different places, right? That could go on this side or maybe more cleanly on this side. Huh. That's kind of interesting. What did I say? So this is a, the diameter of this is 2.45 millimeters. So the, the hole that houses the threaded insert is actually going to be somewhat larger in diameter than this hole that goes over the pipe. Um, which is not a bad thing. Like that's, that's just a thing I'm saying out loud. So. Hmm. I'll tell you what, so one of the things I'm, I'm thinking about as I look at this is when you press these, you know, these heat set inserts into a part, which you do, you can either buy like the actual expensive uh, tool that like is, is basically a soldering iron with a special head that nestles down into that insert. 
um, and heats it up and you can press it into your part. Or you can just use a soldering iron with a, uh, a pencil tip, um, which is what I'm going to do because I don't own the $120 tool that they make specially for these or for the fancier versions of these, presumably these are, are cheap inserts. Um, but when you do that, right, as you melt these parts into your 3D print, there's a certain amount of a spoil that accumulates on the downstream side, right? As you're melting this into the part, some of that melted plastic is naturally going to sort of pile up behind the part. Um, and that's going to be something we're going to want to account for because I'm going to want my grub screw. Let me get Mr. Creepy out of here. Mr. Kabuki. I'm going to want my, my screw to definitely be able to thread all the way through this coupler. Right, so that it, atta it, it touches the, the brass rod inside of my part affirmatively. Now, one thing that's going to help us out, right, is the, the bolt is smaller. The scrub screw is smaller than the coupler, right? So that's, if, even if we have some spoil built up around the sort of the edges of our hole where the screw is, we should be able to still force it through. Um, but... As I'm thinking about where this hole is going to go, I think I actually, like, so I, I was originally thinking maybe it would go in the back side here, but now I'm thinking it probably comes out the front. And maybe I either use a, a, a three millimeter um, threaded insert, or maybe the insert just hangs out the front a little bit. Um, just so, um, just to try and minimize the amount of spoil that's going to be pushed into this hole where the brass rod has to go. So let's get our insert hole centered on the brass rod. And we'll put a circle in the center of that. And we said our diameter for that was 3.75 millimeters. Wow, it's almost as wide as our, as our piece at this point. I should probably, I'll go back and thicken that up. In fact, why don't I do that right now? So that original extrusion was 4 millimeters. Let's make it 6 millimeters. And now, by the power of <laughs> parametric design and constraints, our circle is still centered. Huzzah, huzzah. Let's make sure that bottom extrude. Yeah, something's, of course, gone horribly wrong there. We'll take that bottom extrude and extrude it direction to object to here and join and chamfer. Okay, that's still looking okay. Um, and now we'll come back to this sketch, and we're going to want to extrude it, but how far? Probably to... Well, we don't want the threaded insert to go any deeper than this hole, though the the uh, the bolt itself will have to. So I think what I want to do is basically extrude. Now, I think if I just extrude this shape to that hole, it's going to throw me an error because not all of that shape, when extruded perpendicular to my sketch, intersects that hole. Um, so, although it... Oh, it's exactly three millimeters, right? Because that was my offset that generated this part. So we're actually just going to do a, and I should do this as a parameter, but I'm, I'm being quite lazy. Uh, I want to do this as a distance extrude and we'll do minus three millimeters and we'll cut right to there. And then we'll do a second smaller cut for the bolts to poke through. So we'll do that cut. We'll come back to our sketch. And then, so right in the center here, we're gonna need a hole that is just, just the width of this bolt and some clearance. So that's 2.95 millimeters. So let's make a 3.2 millimeter hole right down the center here. Uh, 3.2 millimeters, finish sketch. And that one we can extrude if we bring that sketch back. We extrude that one let's say all the way to the center of our pipe, which I could do math about, or I could just do this. There we go. So there's our there's our piece. So the threaded insert will only go in as far as, in fact, maybe it should go in not even quite as far as the hole itself. Maybe it only goes in 2.7 millimeters or cuts in minus 2.7 millimeters. Right, and then the there is a slightly smaller hole. You can kind of see there's a lip there now. So the threaded insert doesn't go quite all the way to the brass pipe, but there is in theory a hole that the bolt could itself protrude through. And of course, it's it's only going to go and touch the brass rod itself, but there's some additional clearance into there. Is your center hole for the pipe the right size? I believe so. I stole it from Thomas's design. Um, let's that's worth a double check, Chris. So sanity wise, I guess all I can also go back and reference that this is four point. This is 
five millimeters. Oh, is that right? Maybe not. Oh, maybe I, you know, maybe I've mixed up diameter and radius. Yeah, I sure have. So this should be 2.45 times two. Now let's see if we've screwed the parametrics up there. Oh, not too badly. Not too badly at all. Look at that. I do want, I'm gonna go back and correct this. This cutoff top part is now a little bit silly, but no, good catch, Chris. I, I would not have caught that. So yeah, so now, yes. So the threaded insert goes in most of the way. In fact, maybe we can, uh, top of the lead of thick. So Thomas, yeah, for sure. This back is probably also thicker than it needs to be, but I think we'll be okay. Um, yeah, we could maybe here, I could even maybe push this out just a little more because it's not really for anything structural, right? This is just so I can register the adjacent hooks to be, um, you know, uh, in this in the same orientation using that flat side. Something like that. It's kind of interesting. The other thing about this design, right, is that the the yeah, Chris, you totally nailed that. I I yeah, the bolt is way smaller than the pipe in real life, right? But I was not thinking with my brain. I was thinking with my mouth <laughs> as I was talking to y'all. Um, so thank you. I, I, this is why I do these things on stream, because you guys catch these things. Um, I, one of the things about a design like this is that I can use it in this orientation, but I could also, if it's structurally strong enough, I could use it as the blue model as well, right? This, this could be, it, you know, maybe the operations model of this is 45 degrees up instead of straight down. I guess we'll sort of see an experimentation. Um, but I, I think this is the my, my guesstimate for how this might work. Um, shall we export it, slice it, and get it printing? Rhetorical question, yes. Yes, we shall. Uh, so we'll do a little save a We will take our body and save it as a Kabuki hook. Uh, Kabuki hook 321.1. We'll come over into Prusa Slicer. Some mass removal on the thick side make it more trust-like. Yeah, that's that's fair, Chris. Um, let's see what the printing time is here. I might just opt to get a couple of these printing and then come back and find things up a little bit. Let's see, we'll do like four to start with if it's not an unreasonable print time. So four of these at 0.2 millimeter layer height, consistent across the board will be a 23 minute print. That seems totally reasonable. Um, let's get in close to one of these here and just make sure that our our details are coming out. So we do have, you know, we do get a little lip on the inside. We get some decent resolution on the curvature here. And I guess this dimensioning is not totally critical because it's for a heat set insert. So we have a little bit of play there. So yeah, let's get, I'm gonna get four of those printing um, and then we can think about next steps. So. As usual, you get to watch the not entirely uh, captivating process of me exporting G-code files and starting to warm up the printer and so on. But that's all right. I am still waiting to get my, um, not my, woof, there, that's a, <laughs> that's a, a gaffe. Uh, not my printer, um, but the, uh, the printer that lives in my workshop at work um, is still at home with my boss from our uh, winter shutdown. Um, and this is, I, I, this is not any slam on him because he is holding down the fort in so many different ways. And I like, I totally like do not mind that he is not prioritizing packing up this printer uh, and bringing it back in when I know it's been fun and interesting. It also is like a little bit cumbersome to do. Um, so totally fine. But if I'm just grousing for, you know, grousing sake, uh, I will say I am now accumulating projects at work that would be solvable by the 3D printer, including making some more exhibits functional. <laughs> um, like, uh, actually, I'll, when, I, when I'm done getting this print started, I'll show you the, the design I cooked up to get another exhibit interactive functional again. Um, but I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting on my boss to bring the printer back to us. Dan, if you're ever watching this, it's totally fine. Like, seriously, you're saving my butt in so many different ways. Don't sweat it but I would like that printer to be back. Anyway, um, let me grab the oldie flash drive. 
turn up the lights on the printer a little bit so I can see what I'm doing. And we'll bring the flash drive in. We'll go to our folder OG code things. We'll grab the Kabuki hook and put it on the flash drive. And we'll go and print it. There we go. Grab that guy. Oops. Drop the flash drive. Put the flash drive in. And 23 minutes and 25 seconds later, we will have some hooks to play with. So, hi. <laughs> I need a refreshment break real quick. Um, and then I want to show you this, the... Just because, just thinking of it, I, I think it's cool. We'll show you the the thing we've come up with to get an interactive working again at the museum. Actually, I'll show you two different things, totally different. Um, one of which is, let's see. I think I moved one, at least one of them out of my editable documents. But uh, yeah, I totally did. Maybe both. Oh, here. So here's one. All right. This is the the simpler of the two. Um, so down in our coal mine exhibit at the museum. So for those who have not been to the Museum of Science and Industry, which as always, I do not represent in any of this. This is just me being a nerd, but I love my job. So I like to brag on the cool things that are there. Um, we have, uh, from the time the museum was built in the 1930s, uh, some coal mining equipment of the time and of the era um, that was taken from an active coal mine that was like working in the 1910s and transplanted to the basement of the museum and functions. It doesn't really matter. In any case, there's also some like old coal miner mannequins down there who are like working some of the machinery. And on their headlamps, on their hard hats, they have some little uh, head mounted lanterns. Like when you think of like a miner's lamp, uh, you know, it's a, a big yellow hard hat with a light on the front. So, you know, you do your work in your mind with your light in your head, except because these were from the early 1900s and they're, they're genuine artifacts. It's a real hard hat from the coal mining company. Instead of having battery operated light, what they have is a um, I believe, and I, I'm not a chemist, I may be getting this wrong, I believe the idea is that they run on calcium carbonate. Um, it's a, a substance you could buy and maybe can still buy as a powder. This this thing, which is a 3D model of the actual artifacts we have on the floor, um, in the real version would unscrew at the base here. You'd put this calcium carbonate in, and I, like I said, I, it may not be calcium carbonate. The punchline is whatever this chemical is, when you add water to it, it, it releases gas. And that gas is acetylene, which if you've ever done any gas welding you may be familiar with, it burns very hot. And so what these miners lamps are is a little container of, I think it's calcium carbonate, uh, that you add water to that comes up here. There's a little wick that you light on fire, a little like nylon wick next to this part and a large reflector that mounts in front of this snout. So you add a little bit of water, maybe through this little flap up here, it starts to off gas, you light up your wick. And so you have a little flame powered headlamp that you wear on top of your head. How cool is that? Um, because it's been, you know, 70 or 80 years, we only have one of them that's in any condition to be on the floor currently. The others all live down in safety in our collections department. And so the coal mine tech, one of the coal mine techs, came to me and was like, hey, you 3D print things. Do you think his his idea was that we could scan these things, which are only maybe four inches tall max, like do like a 3D photogrammetry scan of them and then print them. And maybe like a 3D scanner, which we don't have access to, could do such a thing. The photogrammetry we have tried in with some other objects, and it seems to work better for larger scale things than this, at least with the resolutions of camera that we've been working with. So I said, this is a relatively simple mechanical object. I will just model this and print it, and we'll turn it into, you know, we'll paint it up. They'll put some gold and brass on it. It's dark down there in the coma. It doesn't have to be perfect. And we'll have these little mock-up acetylene miner headlamps. So this has been a real, a real fun side project for me is getting this model together um, with its various doodads and goo-gaws and how that might actually work. So that's been fun. Um, that's the purely aesthetic thing. The mechanical thing, and this is the one that I definitely took out of my editable documents and I hope I put it in the right folder so I could actually find it again. Yeah, uh -huh. so this is our 
stylus, oh, this is draft one, at least, of our stylus adapter for uh, a new interactive that was installed over our winter shutdown. Oh yeah, it's telling me it's not editable, but I don't really care because I'm not going to edit it. Um, the idea of this is, this is actually a really super cool interactive that's brand new. Um, Chris, is you shoving a small LED in there? Uh, not yet. Uh, our coal mine tech is really interested in doing that, so I think he probably will. Um, first draft is just to get the aesthetics right, and then we'll probably do some electronics as well. Um, I don't really have any experience with LEDs. So, uh... So this, uh, <laughs> this, this interactive here... Um, we have this new interactive called the friction table, or we call it the friction table. Um, and what it is, is a, maybe a six foot long stainless steel table with four stainless steel troughs in it. And in each of these troughs sits a plastic puck with a material on the bottom side of it interfacing with the table. And the materials are something like, there's one that's like smooth felt, there's sandpaper, there's like a basketball material. Um, and something else, maybe all the other stainless steel. So these four pucks with these either labeled A, B, C, D in different colors of plastic, it's very easy to tell which one's which, with different materials between them, you know, built into the back of the puck between them and the table. On the exhibit next to this table, there are the four identical pucks, so you can feel them and be like, oh, right, a basketball is grippy, a stainless steel puck is smooth, and so on. Um, and the point of the interactive is there is a, a, uh, hand wheel, a hand crank wheel on the control surface uh, with an angle readout next to it. And as you turn the control wheel, the table slowly tilts up. You can see the angle of the table changing. And next to this, there are four more angle indicators, one corresponding to each of the four pucks uh, and a sensor in the table that can tell as the table tilts when that puck starts to slide. Um, I don't know what's doing that sensing. I think it's I actually don't know. I don't know if it's doing distance sensing or or how it's determining proximity there. Um, I haven't looked inside of it yet. But um, when a given puck starts to slide, say when puck A's starts to slide, the angle readout corresponding to puck A stops changing. Uh, and so the point is you you crank the table up, it tilts, it tilts, it tilts, and you know probably the stainless steel puck starts sliding first, and the one that has sandpaper goes next, and the one that has basketball texture, really grippy rubber, goes last. And as they one by one start sliding, you get a readout on each of the displays on the interactive of what angle they started at. So when you're done and they've all slid to the bottom, you can see, oh, stainless steel started sliding at 20 degrees inclination, and basketball started sliding at 40 degrees, and sandpaper at 23 degrees, or whatever, and learn about friction through interactivity, right? The whole point of the museum is learning through interactivity. Um, that's not what they would say their mission statement is, and I, it's, it's probably not their entire purpose, but for my part of the interaction with the museum, learning through interactivity is one of the best things that we do. So that's the exhibit. Problem is COVID, <laughs> as with all things these days, that canned crank wheel is a problem because we are basically eliminating all interactives that you have to touch with your hands for cleanliness reasons. Even knowing that like it seems like touch is not a huge vector for these things, but we also, it's a huge destination for kids. And if there's one thing kids love to do, it's touch things. And if the other thing they love to do is put their hands in their mouth, even wearing a mask. So we're just like anything you can touch not really a great idea right now. We do pass out like disposable styluses to every guest. So the idea is you can use a touch screen because you're only touching your stylus and that works works pretty well. Um, so we, we have this new friction table interactive and we really want it, uh, well, the museum is, is fine with it being what it is, like the safety comes first. I'd really like to see it in action because it's it's been in the works for about a year and it's really cool. Um, and so how do we take this thing, which is meant to be cranked by hand and make it something you either A, don't have to touch or B, could touch with a stylus. Um, and so that's all that this is. That very that long and rambly preamble is just a lead up to what the heck is this thing. This is a adapter that goes around the existing handle, which I think I modeled. Let's see. I must have modeled and moved at some point. Um, yeah, some, somehow I've, oh, Maybe that's the old handle? Let's see. Is this the real handle? Yeah, okay. So yeah, so what happened is we had, I was given one set of dimensions for the handle and then it was correct. Those turned out to be the wrong model of handle. So I just built an, um, a new model based on the actual physical handle that's installed on the thing. Um, but we'll make a two part clamp together adapter 
so that when you have both parts in, the idea is you stick your stylus in here and then you use that to crank the dial. Um, of course, the, the crank is not like a, you know, a mechanical crank in any way. It's actually, it's, it's a digital crank that's interfacing with a PLC underneath the exhibit, which is driving a pneumatic piston that's inside the, the, uh, the glass case that encloses this table um, so that guests can't get their fingers stuck or get hurt or steal things or run away with pucks or whatever, they sneeze on it. Um, and so it's not terribly hard to turn this crank. So the idea is you, you know, we, you stick your, stick your stylus in here and use that to turn the crank. And it has a clever arrow <laughs> showing you which way to turn. But also the idea here is that this shape, right? If we took this arrow away, it just becomes kind of another handle with a hole in the top, which is good. Like the hole helps us turn the handle without, you know, using your hands. But if, if I were a child and I saw what looked like a handle, I probably would just grab it and turn it. And so the idea here is to make a handle that is actually kind of unappealing to grab and turn. I mean, certainly you could reach in here and grab this, but because you have this kind of uncomfortable shape on the top, hopefully that will encourage guests to use the styluses. There's also signage going up and like a sticker going on the displays, like use the stylus, and that's kind of the theme of the whole museum. So hopefully that will work. But this was a real fun thing to draft up. Um, as something that has to interact with the physical object, it has to have the right amount of clearance. It has four holes for uh, bolts of a particular size that's written down, machine screws that are written down in my office at work. Um, and then some, um, some nicely sized holes for the matching lock nuts. So this will actually screw onto the handle from both sides and the lock nuts will keep it in place. Um, hopefully nice and durably, because durable is also the name of the game when you have children running around grabbing things and wanting to do things with them. So that's been the the two fun work 3D printing projects this week, and all of, all of this was a long sort of non sequitur to why I want my 3D printer, not my 3D printer, why I would like there to be a 3D printer back in my workshop at work, because I find them tremendously useful. Um, yeah. In any case, I, now I'm just sort of rambling as the as the prints continue. It's already at 41% done. Um, yeah, stand by. One more refreshment break, and then I will move on to another another project. Yes, I know what it was. Sorry for the long and boring pause at the back of my sort of lightly uh, haired. I'm sure you got a lot of sheen going on from, you know, the minimal amount of hair that's back there these days. Um, I have about 10 minutes before the print finishes, and there is a brainstorming exercise that I have been meaning to do with regard... This is kind of getting back toward demi lighty stuff. Um, and pocket RDM stuff, which I know we haven't talked about in an age. Um... Now, it's not going to be directly Pocket RDM related, but here's the brainstorm I want to do. And I think this is going to be great because 10 minutes is basically, you know, it's the right amount of time to spend on this. Um, but, oh, Thomas asked, does the lock for the coupler, updated coupler since you actually work? Haven't tried it yet, Thomas. Um, yeah, actually haven't. Ha oh, the, uh, now you're talking about the, the pinhole lock or the, the lock between the two components of the coupler? Because the lock between the two components of the coupler actually works quite well. So, like, if you're talking about this interface, that works quite good. I have not, I have not tried like poking a hole through the brass rod and locking that in, but this interface works much better, I think. Between the components and the servo, ah, that I haven't tried, but I certainly will because I'm going to put a new a new Thomas coupler on the servo before we test the uh, the Kabuki drop. So. So I don't know, but we'll get there. Um, so here's here's the brainstorming exercise. So I actually have a consulting gig coming up um, that this, I may or may not use these ideas for, but um, I basically need a device uh, that I can program that speaks uh, DMX in and sends probably some serial signals out. Um, which I'll, I'll do with a software serial port. It's not terribly timing critical. 
Um, but it occurs to me, you know, wh one thing, wh what we currently in spec is probably like, and because, because they're looking for a basic hardware solution is an Arduino Uno with a DMX shield on top. That would be perfectly fine, right? We'll do some reinforcement. I'll print them up a nice case. That would be perfect. That's what they've asked for, in fact. It's perfectly sufficient. But I think it would be nice in the long run to have a more versatile control board um, that, you know, is basically an, like, like a Demi-Light board, but more fully featured. So it's got, you know, DMX in and out, um, but also connection points for the other useful signals on the AT Mega 328. And so what I want to just brainstorm real quick is the AT Mega... 32.8, uh, call it peripheral board. That's an awful name, but. And so what I want to brainstorm is if I, to design a general purpose board that, you know, is made to force for a project that I don't know about yet, that is meant to, you know, take in DMX and do something Arduino-y with it or spit out DMX and be a controller. Like what are the connections the terminals, the functionality that would be that should be built into such a device to make it as sort of versatile as possible, if that makes sense. So I'm just going to start spitballing them. But if you have things you're like, oh, if I bought like a, you know, a DMX Duino, which I think is already a product and is not quite the thing I'm thinking of, but like what would a general purpose reprogram reprogrammable DMX board have? Um, you know, DMX in and out. Uh, we'll think about connectors for that in a sec. Actually, maybe, maybe you think of them now. So probably like three and five pin D, uh, XLR footprints would be nice if they can be overlapped. So they're not, it's not a huge thing. Maybe it's both. Um, maybe screw terminals as well. Um, and maybe solder points as well, just for like really permanent things. Um, for, oh, Thomas says, I see. I meant, uh, I rearranged it so the screw goes inside the part where the pipe is. So it holds both halves together and to the servo. Oh, Thomas, I didn't understand. I get it now. Thank you. Yes, we will. I've got, I've got a servo here. We'll, we'll, let me get through this brainstorm and then we'll, we'll play with that coupler because that seems great. I'll confess, Thomas, I, I've not worked with the couplers or the project really at all this week until tonight. So we'll, we'll find out together. That'll be fun. Um, other things, we're going to need some, I'd like there to be some kind of addressing method on board, um, which maybe is dip switches. Not the most versatile. It could be like a pocket RDM style screen. Um, although really that's just I squared C, uh, ports and general IO, of, um, available. Um, it probably wants, move my beer out of the way, it probably wants GPIO, right, maybe in either Phoenix or Screw Terminals. Phoenix or Screw Terminals or Solder. Um, it wants some kind of mounting. It wants indicators for let's say power uh, DMX presence, probably some like some lights on the DMX lines. Um, maybe a five volt indicator for having an external regulator on it. I guess that's a good question is like, do we take a range of powers? Um, what am I missing here? Addressing GPIO, it's got, you know, what is a, what is a, uh, what does a general purpose board need? Maybe, maybe it has footprints for some FETs so that you could do some higher power driving things and you could choose to populate them or not based on the needs of the project. Um, what I'm, what is, what's sort of a, like styling this is like this, this consulting gig I had coming up that's, you know, basically taking DMX in and spitting some other serial out. The, a, the, a Demi Light board will do those things. It's just that the form factor of the Demi Light boards is optimized for small size and for the particular constraints of wanting to be able to like chain them together and keep them inexpensive for my personal use and for your personal use and all these things. Um, but for a project where I'm going to, you know, build one of these over the course of a day 
and make it right and sell it <laughs> to somebody as part of a project or or use it as an implementation as part of a project you know there are certainly situations even right now at the museum where it's like wow if i had a simple like dmx playback device uh that i could shove in here that would have a little bit of interactivity with it that would solve a lot of my problems um for that it's okay for it to be bigger and fuller featured and so that's what I'm, I'm kind of imagining as a thing that would be useful and the sort of point of this brainstorming exercise is like what what would be the things to make a general purpose sort of dmx control board useful i don't know if like a motor driver is necessarily a thing that could maybe be in the category of optional footprints right like a motor driver footprint um like an h bridge style thing so you could use it as a stepper motor driver or something like that um yeah the so like one of the things we'll think about is you know addressing like dip switches would be awfully convenient it might also be um like header jumpers that you install or remove um Maybe I'll write that down as part of the brainstorming. Like other ways, I guess it could be. Um, let's let's keep the list. Headers. It could be uh, thumb wheels, like the little tiny wheels that you turn. And whatever these are, they'll probably have to be managed by some outboard hardware because even you know a nine position dip switch. I don't want to take up nine GPIOs just for that. So we'll probably do these on probably on a shift register, um, just to take up less less space, less, less IO for just the addressing portion of things. Um, hmm. What am I forgetting? Power mounting indicators for power and DMX, maybe some general purpose indicators, right? So you could do some sort of status indication, um, you know, have a, a red and a green led hooked up to a couple of arbitrary gpio pins just to make things a little bit easier we probably want some prototyping space on this board just because it's nice to have a few little uh you know 100 mil spaced pads that you can you know tie things into you know if you i i need a switch i need a small capacitor i need a, a pull up or a pull down to make this circuit work it's nice to be able to do that right on the same circuit board for this kind of like general purpose thing um what else what else goes on a general purpose dmx board maybe a button maybe like one button that you could use for uh oh maybe a maybe a reset button as well would be a useful thing to have Uh, and then we'll probably include the programming header from Demulite 0.96 uh, so that you didn't have to. So Demulite 0.96 programming and the um, ICSP header. So you could load the Arduino bootloader onto it and then use a serial adapter to program it after that. That would be really handy. So a lot of this is basically just like take the Demulite board and instead of trying to constrain it to a 35 millimeter by 35 millimeter square, blow it up to, you know, two by three or two by four and make it more functional. So anyway, thank you for indulging me as I just run down the list of features that I think something like that would have. Because I think having a board that had these, you know, capabilities would be useful for a lot of my, you know, incidental side projects and consulting gigs. So we'll see if we spin that up in the future. Um, as usual, right, I'm working in, you know, Demulite project is like, far along the kabuki project is sort of halfway done pocket rdm is still at its early stages this i'm brainstorming and i don't know about y'all but this is how in my hobby life i like to work i find it very freeing to be able to say ah tonight i feel like working on something that's nearing completion and tonight i feel like working on something in its infancy and that like the you know in in work or in school or whatever you have like you often don't get the choice of what phase of a, of a project you feel like working in at the moment right you, you have a project and you have to finish it so if you've done step b now you have to do step c next and so i find it really refreshing to be like i i'm energized about starting a new thing or i'm energized about finishing a thing i should probably be a little bit more energized about finishing things in general I'm not great at it but you know it's a hobby it's it's but part of the fun of it we're at ninety three percent on the hook prints. I'm just gonna take a little, a little peeky at the print, make sure they're behaving right. Yes, they seem to be printing just fine. Ninety four percent. So we'll be finishing in just a second here, and we can try them 
on out. Oh, that's a few that you're not supposed to see because it's chaos. <laughs> um, while we're waiting, let me try Thomas's new coupler design here. Let me zoom us in. Grab my Phillips head. Take this horn off. Yes, Thomas, I to sorry, I totally missed the, uh, the idea of putting the screw through both of them. I thought that the only modification was the hole through there, but no, it's, it's being able to lock them both in place with the screw. That's the critical functionality. So now I have, I have a little bit of gunk left over from the printing process. So let me clear that out real quick. Um, let me get my, get my set of real sharp needle pliers or uh, tweezers out here and just clear some of that out. Let's grab, grab that and we will just clear away a little of that gunk and we'll clear away this little gunky boy here. And we'll just, there we go. That I think will be decent enough. Okay, so now we'll take the So it goes like so. Yeah, so I've got the part that attaches to the servo and I've got the part that attaches to the pipe. Like so, I've actually, I've got a little bit more spoil in here that I'm gonna clear out before we try this. Yeah, there we go. And now you're saying, Thomas, so the screw now is meant to go right down through both of these pieces and hold everything in place. I think, yeah, that's what the, that's the new, the new jam. Let's see here. A little bit finicky to get that screw in for me, but I think that's just because I have some extra floaty bits of plastic down inside there from the printing process. Hmm. Feels like maybe the screw is not going in quite far enough to catch the plastic of the servo itself. Maybe I just need to seat this down a little bit further. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just spinning this here, but it's not biting into the servo plastic. I think it's, yeah, I think the screw is not quite long enough or, or, there's, or the, the distance, the, the screw is, is shorter than the distance it needs to span. So I don't know if you can see, so there's the screw. If I put these in relationship here, I don't know if I can get a camera angle that shows where the actual plastic is. Not that I can really see it, the plastic of the servo, but yeah, if there was like maybe half a millimeter taken out of it, I'd probably start to, to bite. I'm also wondering, Thomas, just looking at this, does this still need to be two separate parts? Like, could there be a singular part that was just this? And you just screw that onto the servo, and then you take your, your brass, and you put that inside of your coupler and pin it in place. We may, uh, maybe there was a design necessity for these to be two separate parts in the original draft, but actually I wonder if they could just be combined. Does that make sense? Maybe I'm missing something. I mean, you'd lose, I guess, so I was saying you'd lose the ability to take it apart, but if they're screwed together anyway, right, this is sort of one contiguous unit. It's like a servo with an adapter to 316 brass rod. Um, yeah, totally could be. I think, yeah, I, Thomas, I think I agree with you. I think that's, that might be the way to go. That would also be a really easy print um, and an easy assembly as well. And then you'd have a lot more flexibility because I imagine some of the distance here, right, is, is driven by the need to have these arms be of you know, a decent mechanical size and you need a lip here for the servo head to sit on and you have a lip here, right? If this is basically just a cylinder with an interior lip, that kind of frees up the design constraint there, which is nice. Uh, screwing it and not gluing it. It doesn't really need to be in two parts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that might be a really, um, it might be a neat thing to do to give us, to give us a try. Well, neat. Yeah, I, yeah. Now that there is a, a good method for the brass rod to go in and lock in after the adapter is screwed onto the servo, I think that's going to be, I think that's going to be a really successful design. Speaking of really successful design, he said, not jinxing himself at all. Let's see how the prints came out. Let's see here. So, 
So, uh, Chris, it wasn't part of the original idea that you could hang the motor and then add the pipe. So you're not trying to hold the pipe while getting a motor clipped in. Yes. Although I think that is still possible if the, in, you know, so you, you hang your motor with this adapter already installed and then you would hang your pipe, so to speak, and then you'd, you know, put your pin or a lock through there. I think, I think what the, the clever thing that Thomas has done by adding this hole is that I had been thinking of a part which of necessity was already pre-attached to the brass. And so we would need the ability to get to the screw, um, the, the screw that mounts to the servo after the fact. But instead what we've done is create a second attachment point, right? So we pre-screw onto that servo and then we have a sort of a perpendicular means of attachment that allows us to sort of field mount that pipe, if you will. We sort of move, move the attachment point from a very fiddly one in a bad place to a hopefully less fiddly one, although we haven't tried it yet, in a less, a less bad orientation for doing it in the air. That's my take on it, at least. Speaking of, let's see how our hooks did. A little bit snug, but I don't hate that. Maybe a little too snug. There's also a little bit of a, I don't know if you can tell, there's a little bit of a burr on this pipe that's left over from the cutting process, probably back when I cut it with a pipe cutter for our, our wedding planning. So that's not helping anything. Oh yeah, just a little bit too snug, but that's my fault. Um, I'll just take it for purposes of experimentation. I will just, these I think were 4.9 millimeters in diameter. I'm just gonna take a rat tail file and give them like a real quick zoop zoop and make them a little bit, just a little bit bigger. Got some atom left in that pipe? I, Chris, I don't, I don't know what that means. Because, because, because burr, is that what it is? It is like, like atoms and burr? Uh... Got some Aaron. I see. Because Aaron Burr. You're killing me, Chris. Okay, so that that's qu kind of nice. Focus there. That looks pretty good. And it's, it's. I mean, just on casual inspection, we'll see how it does with weight on it. But, like, that is a, a decently chonky piece of plastic for our purposes, I think. Um, I could even see, so like I have been imagining these, if we're, if you're, if we're looking at it side on again, hanging in sort of this orientation, right? Where the curtain is straight down here. Maybe it's hanging like just far, uh, sort of back against the stop that is this back edge. So it doesn't, it, uh, 20 degrees, which looked like a lot on paper has translated to about two millimeters of hook space here. And so I think maybe rotating it here. So we have a little bit more safety margin is good. So let's let's try two things. Let's one. Let's see how much this flat edge helps us align them the same, and then we'll mess with these heat set inserts and see how those help us. So I'm gonna thread a second hook on here. I'm gonna do it on the non-bird side. Oh, yeah, I have to do a little quick a quickie file. We'll just thread that on. There we go. That one's a little bit looser. Yeah. So there's the start of our our drop hook. Um, and if I set these down both on the flat side, they have a natural tendency. Yeah, so like if these are at the wrong orientation, I can use that flat edge to align them so they're in the same orientation. Well, that's quite good. All right, well now, I'm looking at this, I'm kind of wondering if doing the threaded inserts while on this brass rod is a bad idea. It might be, but let's find out. I'm going to exchange my soldering irons tip for its needle tip, which I keep handy. Oh no, I've reorganized. I keep a little less handy, but off to the side. Uh, let's see. Got my bin of various soldering tips. Some of which I have literally never used. <laughs> Time for good idea, bad idea. What is that from, Chris? I'm, good idea. Do it, better, better, better. Bad idea. What is that from? And fire. Oh yeah. Yeah, now we're doing, we'll do some hot things, right? So there's the possibility for you know, 
Conflagration. I hope not, as always. I know you hope for. But that's that's sort of the central tension of the of these streams is, you know, me wanting one thing and you wanting another. Uh, <laughs> turn turn the iron on. And make a little space. And grab my inserts here. So I've got a whole box of different sizes. Uh, let's do an M3. I used up my three millimeter inserts. Yeah, so I think we're gonna do our our five millimeter inserts. Oh, Animaniacs, that's a good pull, Chris. That sounds right. That's certainly the flavor of humor. I don't know that I I, I could, could actually tell you whether that's the right thing or not, but that's certainly what it feels like, right? It feels like an Animaniacs joke. Now, how do I wanna get these to stay upright so I can <laughs> actually put a thing into them? Probably with our old friend, Sticky Tack. Which is just so useful for like little quick holding, holding things like this. So I just need these to stay more or less upright while I do crime to them. There we go. So now the other thing I found is really helpful with, with doing this is a pair of angled tweezers, mostly to help the um, the heat set insert release from the soldering iron tip when you're done setting it in. So, let's see here. Get a little water for the soldering iron. Not that we're, you know, not that it needs to be like clean for soldering purposes, but just that, you know, a clean tip will, will conduct heat a little bit better. And of course, I should find my, I should find my safety goggles. Here they are. And, all right, so we will take our heat set insert, I'll pick it up with our tweezers, we'll align it like so. Mm, you know what's gonna be a problem with doing this on the brass rod is, here, look at the relationship between the soldering iron tip and the thing, right? The soldering iron tip sticks way through the insert when it goes in. So doing this on the rod is not gonna be a, it's gonna be a non-starter. That's one advantage, I guess, of using the official, you know, $120 tool is it does not protrude through your insert if it's of a certain size. But like I said, that seems like a silly expenditure for a hobby project. We'll just stick that down in place there and get our insert back ready. So, trying this again in free space, as it were. We'll stick that, oops. Just running out of slack on my iron there a little bit. We'll stick that through and we'll melt. Just melt that gently in. Now we'll see how much of that spoil we have. Oh yeah, and how much we're deforming our hole there on this plasma. I probably should have gone with a slightly lower temperature. This might take a, a couple tries to get right. But it will help, it'll let us prove the essential theory. And actually, the fact that this, this side of the hole is no longer anywhere close to circular is okay, because this side is going to be where our grub screw presses up against. Before we do a second one and potentially butcher that as well, let's get our pipe back out here. And we'll thread our, our slightly deformed hook back onto it. Yeah. And we'll get our grub screw back out. And we'll see, maybe grab an Allen wrench in a second here, if this creates enough. So like right now, right, I'm holding, I should, let me put a little bit of marking on this pipe because I, uh, Imagine it's hard to see when it is spinning versus not. So we'll use the classic spinning indicator method of blue tape. Right right now, I can spin the pipe and the hook spin, you know, spins freely on the pipe with a little bit of friction, but like we, we want there to be no friction. So I'm gonna tighten this as much as I can by hand and then I'm gonna grab my Allen key set. And grab, I think it's a two millimeter Allen key, it might be 1.5. Oh, Chris makes a very good point. That gr the grub screw itself could just be the pin to hang things off of. Yeah, that's 
That's actually not a crazy idea at all. <laughs> yeah, looking at it, that's that's almost just as hook-like as the hook we created. Mm, yeah, so now I, yeah, I'm, I'm experiencing what I have before with these, is that if you don't have, like, a lot of backside clearance for the spoil plastics to go through, it can jam up your threads. So right now I'm kind of forcing the the screw through plastic, which is accumulated on the inside of the, not on the threads itself, but like down down between, you know, where, where it's been pushed out by the action of pushing this in. Which is not necessarily going to be an easy thing to solve. I mean, I could drill it out. I could also do a less bad job of um, putting this in. Chris, I also, I, I kind of like the idea of just using that grub screw. And th so like, yeah, because like this, that grub screw, well, except I would still need, I was going to say maybe using the grub screw as the peg solves my uh, heat set insert problem, but it doesn't. I, I'd still need this grub screw to go all the way to the brass rod. And right now that's just not happening. Well, I, maybe I'll try another insert and try to mangle it slightly less. And I'll turn that temperature down on my iron before I do. It was at like 750, which is pretty aggressive. Um, let's try 450. We'll get our next hook back in. We'll get our next insert ready. And actually, let me see. I think I do have some three millimeter tall inserts. That would be good to use. Yes, I do. There's that guy. That'll also make this easier because there'll be less, less plastic to push through and less spoilage on the backside. Ah, Thomas updated the model to be the the continuous the contiguous cylinder there, Thomas. Yeah, yeah. That's I. You know, the the interlocking fingers model was super cool, but I think the the this one will have the as you say the advantage of simplicity, which will be you know nice for replicability. All right. So let's see here. Let's see. Grub screw as hook. Oh, I see. Yeah. So the the grub screw as the curtain hook, as Chris points out, is good for the like what we were looking at on paper earlier as the red model or as the blue model where it's just a peg. But it does sort of we lose the curtain hang straight down from the pipe methodology. Um, that allows us to sort of maintain stability without power. All right, well, that one certainly went in smoother, and I'll actually let it cool this time, which it will be nice. Grab another grub screw out to play with as we do. These claim to be... Are these really M3? I guess they are. Huh. There's something psychological. I was just looking at my, my little tiny grub screw assortment in my M3 hardware box, and they just, I was like, I couldn't convince myself that it actually was an M3 thread, but they, they are. Um, it's just sort of, there's something psychological about that having less material there because there is no head to the screw that makes it seem to my eye like a smaller uh, part. But I think it's just a trick of the eye. Yeah, again, I've got I've got spoil inside of my insert here. And probably there is something corrective to be done in the 3D prints. Like maybe we do an, an interior chamfer um, to take some material away on the inside part. So as that spoil comes out, um, it has somewhere to go. I'm just going to slide I'm gonna slide the previous experiment off. We'll slide the new experiment on. You can even see down, you probably see on that whole that, that plastic spoil that's coming into the sort of center section here. Safety squints are on! <laughs> hey, James. Safety, just clear and frameless. I think I've said before on stream, I have a I have a very broad nose, and so any glasses that fit me that have a uh, a f uh, non a non transparent what's the word opaque an opaque frame, I just see. There's no way for me to not see them because my my nose is taking up all of the non visible space around my eyes. 
So, uh, yeah, so I, I go with the sort of frameless, clear uh, safety glasses myself. What's actually happening now is the spoil of that plastic is preventing me from getting that brass rod back in. So I think I'm going to do is back this grub screw out and then do a quick file to take some of that spoil out. I don't know that spoil is exactly the right word, but uh, I've, I've said it so much that it, it almost doesn't sound like a word at this point. So I, I think I'm just going to stick with it. Let's do a quick file job to get that hole back to clear. Debris? Debris is good. Debris to me somehow implies, like, uh, something which is separated from an object, like it is cast off. <laughs> Gobbledygook, says Chris. Uh, that's fair. Um, like, melt away. Um, plastic zits is pretty good. Like, what's another, what's another physical process where... Like, you melt something, and this other stuff that melts causes, like, waste or obstacles. Like, what's a good metaphor in that vein? Like, ooze. What else oozes? Um, it's like, what uh, comes to my mind is, like, butter. But butter is great, and this stuff is not. So, like, I, that doesn't quite feel right. Uh, overdraft? Overdraft is interesting, Chris. Although I, that sort of implies to me that, like, it's a byproduct of the design, which it is. I mean, it totally is. But, like, the, the presence of the plastic there itself, in this case, is because of a physical process. It's like a landslide. It's like a lava flow of plastic into somewhere that I, I don't want it to be. Spla it's like the plastic splash zone or something. But that's also, I mean, that, that, those, none of those are quite right. But... There's probably, I, I feel like there is somebody who has, um, <laughs> Thomas says plastic zits are called placne. That's kind of a gross word to say out loud, I'm totally admit, which is effective, I mean, because these are, this is a gross process. I also wonder, so like n going to these M these M3 by three millimeter inserts, I could make this surface just a little bit thicker and have the insert basically stop farther from the hole. Right now, this is exactly three millimeters, and so the insert is stopping at this plane, and so, of course, any spoil is going to... Uh, oh, sprue is interesting um, from Chris. Like, whenever the, you know, the metal stops here, and the plastic has to therefore flow into here, if the plastic, you know, if we added another two millimeters, so the insert only came to here, and the plastic only came to here, then this interior hole might stand a better chance of being unobstructed. That's probably the, like, the change on the 3D printing end that I would make. I bet you didn't think tonight was going to be a filing stream, but you'd be wrong. Now, am I hitting plastic or am I hitting the insert that I've inset too far? Is my, my next conundrum. Let's see. I'm trying to pick away some of this plastic here and see what I'm actually, what my obstruction is. I think I'm just hitting plastic with this rod. But this is another problem that would be helped by moving the insert out some from the actual hole. It's also, there's just not a lot of surface area on these hooks to get leverage on to actually press them onto the pipe. I need a 3D printed holder for my hand to actually get in there. Here, yeah, maybe I can do a little, a little wiggle worm and get it. There we go. All right, so that's in. So now, let's try this grub screw. Yeah, I, I ripped that fingernail good, Thomas. That's that's not uncommon in my life. Like, I feel like I'm fairly, fairly accustomed to that now. But, you know, surely the, surely the, they'll catch it on the, you know, plain automation system tomorrow and rip it in half, and that'll be a, a bigger problem. All right, so screw that. Ah, okay. So, grub screws all the way in, but... Now I've started to spin. You guys can see, let's see if we can get this to focus. That heat set insert is just spinning in the plastic there. 
so that's no good. I just don't have enough enough grip on the plastic. So as I started to torque that grub screw in, now I'm just spinning that insert. Well, I mean, there's a there's right ways and wrong ways to solve that, but the wrong way would be to just melt a little more plastic around that insert. Do some soldering iron crime. We haven't done much crime tonight. I felt like doing a little bit of crime. I drove six hours across the state today with no crime. So a little bit, I, I, I have a little bit of crime credit stored up, I guess is what I'm saying. And this is this is what I'm gonna use it for. Yeah, making making the side where this um where this insert is like thicker would would certainly help. 3D print to fill it out. I wish I had one. Um but that's not a that's that's a better idea than just like mushing it with a soldering iron for sure. Yeah, this is gonna fall apart now. Alright, well, I've got two more hooks printed to experiment with. Let's go for so, I've, so this one. The, I deformed the hole. This one, we're stripping the insert out. Let's try number three. So what did we learn? So I'm going to use a, a three millimeter insert and I'm going to very gently put it in and I'm not going to make it flush with the surface so it stops shy of actually impinging on our central hole where that brass rod has to go through. And grab another three millimeter insert out of the three millimeter hardware box where I think there's also M2 threaded inserts for some reason. All right, let's try this again. Clean some of the melted plastic off my soldering iron tip. Uh, James S2 is an iron attachment. It's a standard tip, just a standard tip. I'm using the like get the focus there the sharpest sort of pencil tip that I have but it's just a standard tip let's see there I know you can't see anything we'll we'll, we'll have the prestige in a moment here yeah so that's that's quite better I think so that's just a little bit proud of the surface there by maybe a millimeter which does mean that I don't have this top ring of knurling embedded in the plastic, so I'm gonna have a lot less grip. I mean, to your point, Chris, right? I, I, this front side just needs to be thicker. Maybe we should just do that. But let's try, which is what it feels like to put a grub screw in this real quick. So this goes in here, nice and gentle-like. Well, best one so far. Ooh, yeah, I don't know if you can see, but I can see, if I screw it far enough, you can see that grub screw coming down into where the brass rod would be. Hey, that's exciting. That's the whole idea. All right, well. Little CA glue? Yeah, that's actually, that's not a bad idea. Just glue it to help it hold. Um, let me grab, where's my rod? So here's my brass rod. I probably have to give this a quick file to get this to fit right. And we will, which side is my burr on? It's that side. Just do a little, a little wiggle. We'll get that onto the pipe. I'm gonna take this tape off for now. Leave that little bit there for show. And now, if I tighten that grub screw down onto the pipe, yeah, now, now it's locked pretty tight. I mean, not perfectly tight. Let's see if we need to, let's do another quarter turn. Don't want to deform the pipe. But that that is much more solidly attached, maybe another quarter turn than previously. That doesn't, doesn't want to turn independently of the pipe. Well, that's good. Let's do, uh, let's do the, other, <laughs> the other hook that's currently printed that's not mangled. Um, and see if we can get a little micro drop going on tonight. So once again, I, I know from camera angle's sake, you're going to probably see mostly the back of my hand as I put this in. I apologize, but I'm 
going to just insert the insert there, melt it gently down, but not all the way down. Leave it sticking out a little bit there. Yeah, not a little bit deeper than the last one, but I think that will be okay. We'll let that cool as I grab yet another grub scrap. I guess I can salvage a grub scrap if one of these failed experiments. Mm, or maybe I'll just grab a new one. <laughs> new grub screw. And let's see how this goes in. So still a little bit of that plastic um, obstructive melt or whatever we decide to call it getting in the way of the grub screw right as it sort of gets to the end of the insert, but a lot, a lot less than in the other attempts. So having some sort of clear space behind the insert is hugely helpful. And again, yeah, I don't know if you can see it, but I am getting that grub screw to come in f into the space where that brass rod will go. So that's, that's encouraging. Um, give this guy a quick file. And let me give this end a quick file. This is that bird end that Aaron bird and that hummingbird and let's see if I can get it to go on this end because I think it'll be a little bit easier. Take the sticky tack off. Let's see if we can get this to... Yeah. All good. All right, so that's my two hooks. And now I take my flattened sections. I place them flat on the table. I can align them just so. And now I can tighten the second grub screw. Is that tight? I think so. Do another quarter turn. Oh, <laughs> you know, I was like, this feels a lot easier than the last one. You might have seen it before I did. I'm actually pulling the threaded insert out of the uh, of the print. Look at that. Well, that's not what I want. Let me take this grub screw out, and then I think we're just gonna sort of tap tap this like a putter down down back into the print there. Mm -hmm. Could do a nut slot, says Chris, instead of doing the um, the threaded insert. Could totally do. Yeah, yeah. I could do a little a little M3 nut. Let me see. Just for scale sake, while that cools, let me pull a nut out of the M3 hardware bin. Yeah. So we could like do a do a slot where the little nut sort of slots in from the side and then is held captive by the action of the screw pressing into the rod. I don't hate that. That would be less fiddly. Um, I'm having a, a better experience of threaded inserts this time than I, I usually do. I, I, I eliminated them from the Demi Light design because I just... Trying to get the... You know, it's not that they're a bad idea. It's just that trying to get them in a precise physical location in relation to other parts um, or in relation to themselves because of them, like the inaccuracy of the melting part of the installing of them... Um, I was just was tearing my hair out trying to get them to line up with the PCB. Um, but a nut slot is, would be a, a solution to that. This is still not particularly tight. Let's see, am I, am I tightening on the rod or am I pulling the print out? I'm tightening on the rod. Ah, are we still aligned? Where's my alignment? Yeah, still pretty aligned. Well, that's pretty good. That's pretty good there. Um, let us let us give this a quick try. Uh, here we go. Come back to the micro stage and let me take a hot second and think about where power for the truss warmers is coming from because I think that's going to make it easier to see what's actually happening in here. 
Um, and I may have to... Oh, uh... Where is my adapter? Have my DMX line. I know you can't. <laughs> I'm like rustling around in the darkness a lot tonight, but I guess that's not that different metaphorically than any of the other nights. So I'm going to plug in my DMX to four pin adapter here. And I'm going to plug that into one of our little Phoenix terminal splitter boards with a power injector. That's going to get, so that's right. I've got DMX coming in from my little <laughs> donkey micro control. I'll put power in here and that'll let us power the, um, the truss warmer so we can see a little bit better. I think what's happening there. I'm going to take the safety goggles off as they fog up here. Turn the iron off before I forget. Turn the power supply on. Get the Truss warmers lit up. And let's see, is that working? Yeah, there we go. So let's get these back to some kind of, maybe we'll just take it all to white. Maybe that's easier. That's a little bit better to see, I think. Just a little top light on that Kabuki. So I'm gonna take off the existing pipe entirely, I think. There we go. And I'm going to take, actually, let's let's take this piece off and we'll put the Thomas coupler on it. The new Thomas coupler, not the newest. Thomas, I saw you sent me a new file, which I tremendously appreciate and probably will not get to print tonight, but um, let's take this coupler off. And we'll put, the new coupler on and screw through itself, so to speak. Although this was the part we had had clearance issues with, but that's okay. Where's the existing coupler that I had earlier? It might be easier to plow here. It's on, it's on this other servo. Ah, I see, but because we have screw issues, this may not be quite the thing for tonight. Well, in that case, let me fake it for tonight because the hold on the servo is actually fairly good without that screw even threaded all the way in and just by forcing it a little bit I think I can get a little extra friction there just enough to give us a test so we shall rehang that there and we will hang our new kabuki pipe. I think I'm going to move this closest mount. Just back one section of truss, about 50 millimeters. So that spacing lines up and we will, I maybe shouldn't have moved it. Should have kept it closer. Yeah. She wanted to be in the middle of this span, I think. So we'll place this back where it was a moment ago. There we go. Thread that pipe through. Hey, now that's starting to look like a thing. Here, where, where is that camera? I'll try and get you a little, a little closer. So that's what we're looking at at the moment. I gotta find a better system for this camera, but there we are. Maybe I can dip some, oops. <laughs> yeah, clearly, clearly not a, not an ideal system. Maybe that truss warmer is hurting us more than helping us at this point. Um, yeah, so that's our, that's our Kabuki for the moment. And I can tell already that I'm going to actually need to, um, affix the pipe using that pinhole into the cup, into the Thomas coupler, because it's spinning sort of freely inside that coupler right now. And that just won't do. But I could probably come up with a quick and dirty way to do that. What do we want to do? Hmm. I think 
the way that we shall do that is... Oh, do I have my pin vice handy still? I don't think I do. Maybe, it's just, I know this is what not the problem you're proposing I solve, but maybe a little CA glue will do the trick in this case as well, just to hold it in place for tonight. Oh, well, my CA glue is... <laughs> I've CA glued my CA glue to something else. Thankfully, I have lots. Right, well, that ampule is gone. Let's get another ampule of CA glue. Out of storage here. Yes, I know you're looking at my lovely tub. Thank you. It's very nice. Thank you. Yes. All right. So we'll just do a quick, just a quick dabule on the end of the pipe there. And carefully, without gluing plastic or anything to myself, we'll just slip this back on. I don't have any accelerator, so I have to be a little bit careful here. Although I could use, I could use baking soda, that makes a real a quick and dirty accelerant for uh, cyanoacrylate glues. All right, so I think while that sets, we can go ahead and thread this back in here. Yeah. All right, and now I just need a. Uh, what do I need? I need a controller for it. Um, I wish I had a servo extension, but I don't. So we're just going to use the same control board that we were playing with last week uh, to get this fired up, which I think we just used this as DMX and we powered it directly off of the FTDI converter here. And we ran it off of one star. Wow, this is gonna, I, you can't see the Frankensteinery that's happening here to make this happen, and that's really good. Kind of holding the controller in one hand and the FTDI converter in the other. I've run out of room on my USB cable. And I've unplugged the the uh, truss warmers, it's going really great. There must be a better way, but maybe not a way that would involve building new cables right now, which is what I'm trying to avoid. Let's see, what could I move around to make this better? I guess, ah, you know, here's, I, I've got a much better idea. Let's not reinvent the wheel. I have an extant DMX and power line running to the truss warmer controller at the moment. I'm just going to steal that whole power line and bring it over here. I'm, I'm just, well, I know I'm again talking to myself as I do things off camera that you can't quite see. But now, why do you not have power? You should have power. Chris says that light doesn't have a safety cable. It's true. I'm living, living dangerously. Oh, this doesn't. Just... <laughs> All right. I was trying to avoid cables, but in order to do that, I'm going to have to install a power regulator on this control board because right, we were running it directly off of five volts. But now I want to run it off of, uh, you know, twelve to twenty-four volts, like the rest of the demo light ecosystem. So I'm going to have to slap a regulator on it really quick. Just my the price I am paying for trying to take a shortcut. That's okay. Uh, now those regulators live in the. I would have thought they lived in the PCB components box, which is where they should live, and not in the assembly components box. Let's see here. Where are my through hole five volt buck regulators? There we go. These little guys that we love so much. Pop one of those out. And 
dress these headphones a little bit better. All right, get the soldering iron heated back up. Yeah, so in, in trying to avoid some soldering, I have created more of a need for soldering, but I think it's still, I think it's still a net win. I'll turn the heat on the soldering iron back up from our insert experiments earlier. So that's gonna go just there and turn our you know 12 to 24 volts input into the five volts we need to run the controller and the servo. I just got, I got too excited. Like I was like, oh, we're so close. You're never as close as you think you are to, you know, having a thing working. And actually, as usual, right, the building of the jig for the thing, the support materials, the getting ready is four times as much time as the actual doing of the thing. All right, there we go. One joint. Two joint. Three joints. Oh, let's do that ground joint a little bit better. That's pretty good. All right, now, now when we plug this in, we should have, we should have power. We have power, that's a good sign. We will plug that into our servo controller here. <laughs> I'm seeing it move. I'm just not sure where what it's addressed at. Oh, there it is. Can you see it? <laughs> so normally its home position would be like there and we would go boop, and drop something. Let's drop something. <laughs> Got to. All right, let's start real small. I, I, I apologize again for the crappy camera angle. I know it's not the most exciting. But, and really the, the background is just so busy. I, I know it's hard to see, but just hang. Let's hang something you can actually see, like, a, I don't know, piece of paper, piece of <laughs> experimentation paper. Uh, and we will, <laughs> you wanna talk about like doing things in a hurry to, to prove a point? I'm gonna use, oh, you know what I should use as I was extolling its virtues earlier? Floral wire. We'll just use a little piece of that floral wire as our hanging solution. We're not gonna, of course, finish this thing tonight. I just want to, with the hooks and completed the coupler, you know, in a in a decent state, and Thomas has, has provided the updated version for actual printing. I want to drop something from this Kabuki drop tonight after three separate weekends of working on it. And then we'll go on to make it better and not quite as janky. So I'm going to take my piece of troubleshooting paper. Uh, I'm gonna just cut it in half so it's a little bit more manageable for the scale that we're working at and because we're doing this in just such a hurry i am going to grab a piece of floral wire snip that off and just <laughs> blue painters tape it to this piece of paper the world's like cheapest and laziest curtain but I think it's going to do the thing which we wanted all we all want it to do, which is fall. <laughs> right? That's the only parameter. It has to obey gravity. Alright, so there's that. Let's go back to our stage. And we'll hang. <laughs> Alright, here. There we go. So here's our here's our curtain, right? The stage is set. We're ready for the big Reveal, now which way do we go? Actually, we could be like there, right? Oh, uh, and then, uh, I don't know, <laughs> Horatio. What, what can I put behind here to be a big reveal? Introducing a tiny moving light. Ah! <laughs> that's great. I think that's great. So, like no, you know, do we center that up with the, the hooks and vertical and then the servo, right? And if I cut power right now, which I, is easy to do. Ah, you know what's a problem though? <laughs> In the current Demi-Light programming, 
because it's made for a moving head moving light, the when it boots up, one of the things it does to demonstrate to you that it has the range of motion that you think it does is it sends the servos to, I think, minus 90 degrees and then back to home or center rather, and then to the DMX address you set. So I think when I turn power back on, it's actually going to accidentally drop the curtain because as part of its power-up sequence, it moves. Oh, it didn't. Maybe we got a little bit lucky. I did see, you might have said a little bit of twitch. So I think what happens is it's just close enough to that part of its range where it, it didn't move all the way to that end. So I probably, you know, we need to rewrite the code just a little bit so it doesn't do that. But even without power, it stays on its own. And then when it's time for the big reveal, introducing star of the show, isopropyl alcohol! <laughs> well, that's incredibly satisfying. Like, I, there, clearly there's a few things left to, a few things, probably several things, left to troubleshoot and figure out and, you know, maybe make a curtain that's not made in 60 seconds out of paper and tape and, uh, and floral wire. But I think that's going to be really quite successful and easily easy to extend this all the way over to the remainder of our length using the couplers that we now have because don't all servos home themselves powered up they i don't think so um because they shouldn't need to right because they're just doing a comparison between their you know your destination position and their internal potentiometer right um maybe i guess i don't know I didn't think so. I certainly have programmed it to do that as part of the programming. If it's homing itself as well because of the functioning of the servo, it may also be. In that case, I guess the thing... Well, yeah. Hmm. Some more experimentation needed there. Um, I'm gonna do it. Let's do it. Let's do it uh, one more time. Here, I'll tell you what. I'll write a secret message for you uh, on a card and then I'll re reveal it with the Kabuki drop. How's that? No peeking. All right, I have my secret message written. Can I conceal it successfully behind the computer drop? I can. All right, you ready for my secret message for all you, <laughs> all you viewers out there? Let me make sure I'm moving it the right way. It goes down. Three, two, one. <laughs> Thank you all for joining me on another Sunday night of nerdery and kabuki drop and tiny moving lightness. It's been a joy to be here as always and a pleasure and a privilege. I hope you're staying safe. I hope you're doing good out there. Like, comment, subscribe. Find me on Twitter at Jeffers Glass. Call the phone 815-O-Malort. Uh, the phone is a little bit strange right now. It may boot you straight to voicemail. Have some VoIP troubleshooting to do. So please do give me some calls this week and we'll see if it rings. Go straight to voicemail. We'll learn something together. I really appreciate you having you all here and all of your ideas and your comments and your contributions and your models uh, and your cool brains and cool faces. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, did you like that seamless segue into the outro? I did. <sighs> did I mention that I felt like I was moving at 70 miles an hour all day? Still kind of feel like that. I Now I'm just exhilarated that this thing actually works a little bit. So, thank you all. Have a wonderful week. And I will see you next Sunday night at the usual time, 7 p.m. Central, right here on YouTube. Thanks, y'all. Have a good night.